Hello and welcome to episode 1273 of The Sleeper and the Bust. It is Friday, March 22nd. I'm your host, Paul Sporer. Joined this morning by Justin Mason. Justin, one day away from the main event. How you doing? Ooh, this is like the beginning of the end for me right now, right? I got six inning drafts left, uh, one each day until the start of the regular season. Ooh. And uh, yeah, I already got an auction tonight. I'm excited. Your main event tomorrow. Like, it's just... It's time to, it's a go time, right? Like, this is what all the prep has been for kind of these last drafts of the season. Yeah, I know. And like you talked about it on yesterday's show that you've got this big run coming. I didn't realize it was one every day. So that that's kind of awesome, though. I really like that. Apparently, um, neither did my wife. Um, <laughs> who uh, she wants to set up anything with you. And you're like, yeah, nope, can't do that day. Can't I, do that day. I, I was all like, because uh, yesterday was our anniversary. And I kind of Happy like anniversary. Joked, Thank you. I uh, kind of jokingly said to my daughter, um, like, hey, it was really good seeing you. I'll see you next week. Catch up. Uh-huh. I'll be later. And Daniel's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I got to draft every night for the next, you know, six nights. And she's like, what? Excuse me? I'm like, look at the calendar. And apparently I had, we have like a shared Google calendar. Mm-hmm. And I had been putting everything of mine on something on a shared or a Google calendar that wasn't shared. Oh. And so so you, thought you, you thought you were getting ahead of it doing the right thing. And I'm all thing. like, I'm all like, look, you told me to put it on the Google Calendar, and she showed me her phone. She's like, look, it's not. And I'm like, oh, that's that's awkward. You're like, well, uh, I'll catch up with you in about a week. Fifteen years of marriage, and I still can't figure out the simple things. The the the, the shared calendar there. Uh, it, that's a good idea, though. It's a good idea. Yeah. You know, I've been trying to fit some things in. We got two movies in last weekend. Um, so, you know, that was nice to hang out with Jen. She knows that Saturday is going to be super busy. Sunday we'll be able to do something. Then next week will be crazy leading up to opening day. And then once the calendar flips to April, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be saying that I have no time. There's obviously I want to watch games and everything, but I need to be better about stepping away sometimes and just saying, Hey, I can catch up on those games later. I need to disengage a little bit. So I will be better about that, um, this year, but. Right now is crunch time, and I'm excited. I cannot wait for the main event tomorrow. We're going to get into some main event-based stuff here. So if you don't play the main event, I'm not going to say this has no value to you because we are still going to talk about players. And that's why, even though we are pretty main event focused, or at least pretty NFBC focused, the fact that we are talking about players and how we feel about them uh, still has broad value. But what we're going to be doing today after a little bit of news and notes is we're going to get into the big main event ADP shifts. And what I did was I compared all of February's Rotowire online championships. Those are 12 team, but they have waivers. So it's not draft championships. So it's 12 team leagues with an overall component. So you're kind of drafting similarly versus the main event. Now, it's not a one to one. But we talk about the differences that the main event brings. You know, pitchers get pushed up. This gets changed. This and that. Let's actually see when you know things hit the pavement when rubber hits the pavement what really happens so i got a bunch of big moves from the top 100 and then picks one, 101 to 200 that we're going to get into but first we got to hit some news let's start with jd martinez finally landing um and you know nick of time should i don't know i, I don't know if they've said yet but should be ready for pretty close to opening day. i don't know he, he got a week or two to ramp up um actually i guess just a week literally a week but somebody like jd martinez probably grinding in the cage all the time and i know that's not the same as facing pitching but he signs with the mets one year 12 million dollars i think it's a great deal for the mets really nice pickup for them i cannot believe i know he's an older guy and he's dh only blah 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 how did he last this long why didn't miami bring him in i i don't understand but i like this move well, for the mets go ahead the giants offered him the solar contract um and he turned it down well he didn't want to hit in that park not that city uh, field's an amazing park though yeah i think it may have more to do with just san francisco's location i don't think he wants he to be wanted, in the east uh i don't think he wants to be in san francisco there have been a lot of players who have talked about not wanting to go to san francisco because the city is i, I know there was uh, that having movie. such issues so yeah. i my guess is um and i think those issues are overblown but you know Wildly. as a person who, as so. a person who lives here but uh you know every major city has a, a bad area just don't go to that bad area but um exactly. yeah i think i think ultimately he was waiting for the spot that he wanted and this was one of those spots so uh, I'm happy he got paid uh, and, you know, got another contract. And 
uh, I'm really excited because I picked him really, really cheaply in a couple auctions where I got him for like one or two bucks. And that's looking like a really, really good purchase. Absolutely. Yeah. JD Martinez was somebody who in general is going to go cheaper due to, you know, the, the ageism in fantasy baseball that we always talk about the util only factor and yep. being unsigned three massive factors working against JD Martinez, keeping his price in check. And so if you did stay committed and you felt, felt like, Hey, you know, unless he retires, this is going to work out for me. So unless you felt that he was going to retire, it was worth taking the gamble on him. And I think a, a lot of people ended up doing that, uh, that are now feeling pretty good about this landing spot for him. He was going 250 in those uh, February uh, Rotowire Online Championships. And then once the main came around, JD Martinez dropped to 284. Do you yeah. think he jumps back to 250 or higher in this weekend's drafts? Well, let's see. 250 would put him around Andrew Vaughn, Jack Swinski. I would guess he even goes higher than that. Um, maybe jumps up to like uh, the 225 area. Okay, um, so in the um, you know Tyler Eloy O'Neal. Jimenez, who actually just got nicked up, he's at 217. Who, who do you like there, Eloy Jimenez or JD Martinez? Martinez. Yeah, because he's I mean, healthy and ready to go. Or Byron, you know, Byron Buxton's going 214. I think I prefer JD Martinez. I'm close on that because. Buxton is going to get the outfield and his upside is still super rich. Although, although he's already was... nicked up. Oh, he is. I missed that. He's, I mean, I should have like, assumed. he's dealing with a back issue. I, I should have generally assumed, but yeah. one thing I will say about Buxton, I say, you know how much higher his upside is man doesn't have double digit steal since 2019. And I know part of that is the lack of games played, but even if you do some extrapolation for him, these aren't like gaudy totals. If you take yeah. last year and give him 600 plate appearances, it's 16 steals, which is more than, you know, that's double digits, but like, eh, it's not that great. It's, it's not the 30 people, you know, were cla clamoring Especially with for. Especially with a 207 average, I would rather take JD's average power production and eschew those 16 steals uh, and get them elsewhere. So, you know what? I, I think I, that, that is actually much closer for me, and I do maybe I'm, lean I mean, a little bit toward JD. Talk about a coup for the Mets. Like, this is like it's all of a move. sudden their lineup looks a hell of a lot better with JD Martinez in the middle of it. Nimmo, uh, Francisco Lindor, Pete Alonso, JD Martinez is a pretty sick isn't start it, to your lineup. Isn't it weird how one guy can change the dynamic yeah. of the lineup so much? You wouldn't think that. You'd be like, oh, it's one guy that helps, but like, you know, it's not going to fundamentally alter it. I look at this lineup now so much more pleasantly, and I'm like, that is a big move. You slot them right there at that four spot. It helps those top three you mentioned, Nimmo, Lindor, Alonzo. Then you got JD. Then you got someone like Jeff McNeil, who I've never been the biggest fan of from a fantasy perspective, but he gives you late batting average, which is rare. And with those four ahead of him, he could be a sneaky RBI guy. You know, get yeah. you like 75 ribbies that you don't really uh, necessarily expect from somebody like that. He did 75 ribbies back in 2019. Now, that was when he also blasted 23 homers, rabbit ball, et cetera, et cetera. But he had 55 ribbies last year. Could he get 20 more this year if this Mets team performs better? I believe so. By the way, just quick aside as we move on through the news, where are you at on Starling Marte? Haven't heard a single bit of buzz about him this spring. Any interest in Starling Marte? He's old, but now he is cheap still runs at least when he's healthy and playing you know 24 steals last year anything for Stanley Marte for you in a 10 or a 12 team league yes because you have replacement value you can put them on your IL type thing in a 15 team league it's really difficult because you know he's going to miss time mm -hmm. um so uh yeah i mean it's like you know i've got my rotowire online championship draft on Justin Monday. Mason got five spots left to fill um but uh yeah i think he could be in play in a, in a league like that uh and like would it surprise me if he had just one more starling Marte year where he's like a top 75 player it absolutely wouldn't like no he's got power and speed and you know he can't hit for batting average at times so uh i, I mean i've always loved starling Marte, so That's he's never gonna be asking. out of the question for me but yeah, in a 15-team league, I think it's just really difficult roster construction because you know he's going to miss some time. 
The only reason that I would still be pretty much in play for Marte on the 15 teamer is because for the first time ever, you're not relying on him for steals. That's true. He he is a component of your steals that you're hoping to spike extra from, but you're you're penciling him in, I hope, conservatively for like 15 steals. And then if he can stay healthy, you know you can get 30, maybe upwards of even 40 if, if magic really comes through for Starling Marte at age 35. Now, he's coming off a dreadful season. He is having a rough spring, but I'm encouraged. Actually, uh, it's a 143 BABIP. And his plate skills have looked excellent. 16% strikeout rate, 11% walk rate. So maybe he's looking to be more patient to improve his OBP that way. <laughs> the way he usually improves his OBP is not great. It's usually by hit, via hit by pitches. And that's part of why he's hurt all the time is because this dude gets absolutely blasted at the dish all the time. 18 back in 2022 when he played 118 games. Eight last year, four different double-digit Oh, wait, excuse me. No, no, I was. those are his grounds in a double play. He did have eight uh, hit-by-pitches last year, 13 the year before, 13 the year before that. Seven times double-digit hit-by-pitches for Starling Marte, 19 per six, uh, 679 plate appearances. That's crazy. Yeah. Way to take one for your team, baby. I mean, I guess, but it, it has hurt him. Clearly. Yeah, it literally, yeah. <laughs> because this <laughs> game's played counts aren't great. So anyway, just want to get a little side note about him because, uh, like I said, I have not seen much on him. We did not talk about Yoshinobu Yamamoto's uh, debut yesterday. We were catching up after about 10 days off, so I kind of just forgot about it, if I'm being honest. Um, but it was really bad. Do we think it's going to tangibly affect the ADP this weekend in the main event? If so, would it be something that you would be interested in if he took, say, a 15 to 20 pick dip? Because I doubt it would plummet. I, I just don't see that. He's been 35 across the 14 main events that we've seen. Where are you at on Yamamoto's struggles and what it might do to his ADP? Uh, I mean, I guess, I mean, his max is 55. Like, that's still probably going to be too high for me anyways. That, me too. And not because of the bad outing. I want to be no. clear. I don't give a I, crap about that. Yeah, the bad outing doesn't mean anything to me. It's, you know, an early, you know, outing. You know, it's, it's, it's what, two weeks before the start of the actual season? Yeah. Like he's still nerves kind of ramping off up. The hilt or, You're, you know, off the chain. Like I cannot have fathom the nerves that he was dealing yeah. with. You've just traveled 18 hours via plane or whatever it was to get to Korea. Uh, you're in a completely, you know, foreign area, you know, mm -hmm. you know, literally and figuratively. Well, Maybe not so much for him. Well, I mean, Korea's not Japan, so I know. But it I, again, I, yeah, I'm not saying that it, you know all Asian areas are the same. But that's probably wouldn't that be more? I, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. I don't want to speak out of turn. Never mind. I, I would say was that would that be akin to like traveling with the states? About to get canceled on the no, podcast. No, 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 right no, no, here. no, no. I, I, no, because I'm not gonna like make any. No, yeah, no, no. They're, I don't know. they're they are they're you know similar countries, um, and I've I've been to both countries, but. Um, it's still like a, it's still like it's a jarring different. experience. Yeah, it's, it's different, you know, uh, and it's just one outing. Like, I just don't really care yeah. that much. Like, and if you actually go back and like, like in kind of watch each and I watch the whole pitch. Thing. Yeah. Like he, he just missed his spot a few times it's by a couple of inches. Shit. Like, yeah, it, like, I really don't think it was like indicative of like, Hey, this is going to be what Yamamoto is. But I do think there are going to be times in which, like, hey, he misses his spots and, you know, he gets pounded a little bit. Uh, like you know, Senga, yeah. right? He struggled with the control, like the ball He's, difference. Especially for the first half of the season. Exactly. So, like, uh, I, You know, this is one of the reasons why I stay away from kind of these guys who are brand new to Major League Baseball. Uh, you know, because coming you're over. Racist. Yeah. Yes, because <laughs> Shard, just... Shard does not appreciate your racism, <laughs> yeah. man. Apparently, um, no. It's because like there is like this acclimation period on the field and off the field, right? Like these guys are in a brand new country. They don't speak the language. They're not like surrounded by a bunch of friends uh, mm -hmm. that like they can rely upon. Now that's a little different for Yamamoto because he's got Otani on the team. Mm -hmm. uh you know who's another japanese born player but like i still just i'm not paying this price i'm gonna pay the price for uh one of these japanese pitchers it's imanaga because imanaga is going so much cheaper exactly i'll take that gamble there um it's just that yamamoto is full 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 price and i get it because the upside is rich he's on the best team or at least one of regard you know what wherever you feel about the dodgers you can't have him ranked too much further than maybe third if you got like Atlanta and I don't know, maybe Houston ahead of them, but you know, 
you're, you're fooling yourself if you have them ranked much lower than that. Um, I will say though, like if he were to drop to 55, I could entertain it because then you're talking about him going around like Grayson Rodriguez, mm -hmm. uh, Max Freed, Bobby Miller. Like, I think that is probably around the place he should be ranked, anyways. Agreed. That's why I, I have him ranked right around those guys, uh, actually, like a slot behind Rodriguez and teammate Bobby Miller. If he was around there, Yamamoto. Then, like you said, I could at least entertain it. In the 30s, I'm just not there. I'm just not. I'm willing to lose on him if Yamamoto hits the ground running and crushes it. Obviously, he didn't hit the ground running in his very first start. But what I mean is, you know, if his April and May are good and he just takes off, awesome. More power to y'all if you take him. Because, yeah, Can't the last – if if you look at just the three drafts from the last two days, mm -hmm. his, AD, his ADP is 50. Min of 47, max Okay. So, so like, I think that is a more fair, uh, and I could see myself doing that. Like, I, what if I think it's 65 tomorrow, then would you actually like attack for that? Cause I think, saying, entertain I, think him. I might, I, yeah. Like what? I mean, you're still talking about a pitcher we think is going to be very good on the best, uh, team in baseball. Like, mm -hmm. like even if he is just like, let's say like he's an entire season of Senga. So we're talking about, you're getting strikeouts. And he is going deep enough into games to qualify for a win. Like he could win 15 games on the Dodgers and get a bunch of strikeouts. If he even just got a four ERA, like that's yeah. still like a bunch of strikeouts and a bunch of wins. And like 15, 16 wins, like does a lot for your overall value. So uh, obviously a four ERA isn't what you're paying for at 65, but if that's mm -hmm. like the bad outcome, you take that. And, you know, yeah. Senga obviously ran off the big, Big run in the summer, got his ERA down to 298. He had a 122 whip, which is a little bit elevated because of the, some of those early struggles. And the command of the ghost fork is not easy. But he also had 202 strikeouts in 166 innings. Yeah. So, yeah, I think people saw how great Sango was once he kind of settled himself. Uh, Yamamoto was so unbelievable in Japan, going to an amazing team, and that's driving the hype. But maybe this brings it down. And, yeah, if he starts going in the 60s, then I'm more in the attack as opposed to just entertaining it. I, I could see that. Like if he goes after my boy, Bobby Miller, that's kind of my litmus test. Mm -hmm. If Bobby Miller goes and Yamamoto's still there, I might, I might make the jump. It's really interesting to always see like how much the ADP shifts with these early games. I mean, we saw in 2019 yes. with the, the Japan series, you know, we got the Korea series this year, next year, they're going to do another Japan series. Like, this is uh, it's always interesting to see it's like insane to do that but I, by the way i yeah. will say i'm absolutely livid about it we talked closers yesterday two of my favorite targets each got the save suarez yeah. and phillips and they're yeah. both going to jump up because of it and that pisses me off so much <laughs> because they're definitely headed upward uh with their trajectory in fact we're going to talk about suarez he's up relative to the main event from the uh from the ocs as well but let's talk a couple injuries before we get into that matt mcclain to the il he, man it's just one thing after another right now it seems came in with the oblique got through that and kind of you know anybody who had drafted him when that became news okay you feel better uh, but now here we go, another injury, and all of a sudden he's going to be going to the IL uh, with a shoulder issue. And so now you got the oblique that maybe could have still lingered. He was playing so that it was not currently affecting him, but he was he was playing from March 10th to March 18th. He got a week in before left shoulder soreness got him. So as a right-hander, that's going to be his front shoulder. And I don't know the effects of that on power or anything like that. I'm not, uh, that, I don't know, hitting mechanics or anything. But he is going to start the season on the IL. Where are you at on Matt McClain right now? I'm very, very worried. I mean, I, I don't love shoulder injuries. Um, to anybody, you know, hitters or pitchers. Yeah, to anybody. Uh, and I'm, I'm double checking, but I, I'm pretty sure one of the things I saw was they're going to be seeking multiple opinions. Um, and that Until somebody tells us what we want. That's what I always say when that happens. Yeah. Like they just want to hear somebody say the good things. Yeah. And like they made a trade for Santiago Espinal mm -hmm. yesterday as well. Which Remember when they had too me, many players? Yeah. I just like came across a tweet from uh, uh, our friend, Eric cross. And he was all like, Cincinnati has too many players. Marte suspended Friedel uh, fractured rib. Matt McLean, meaty sh uh, shoulder surgery. Um, <laughs> not too many players now. Nope. Um, 
So yeah, this is uh, just a huge bummer of a news because like I had gotten to a point where like in my projections, I had Matt McLean as pretty much in the same tier as the top three second baseman. Uh, yeah, I like, love that. He, he was like right kind of behind them, like, but just by like, like less than a dollar, honestly. So um, pretty much in that exact same tier, I really thought he was an underrated target. Um, and I had started to try to get him in drafts. Uh, I mean, I'm thankful at least the news came out before this weekend. Yep. And yep. like now I can just kind of take him off my board, but he is off my board. Yeah, I'm not going to draft him. I already have shares, so I don't need more Matt McClain with the injury now. Um, Greg and I took him in our $400 DC, and which is something that's really cool and really good planning by two people who yeah. pretend to be good at fantasy is that he is our only current second baseman until we get qualifications. We know Colt Keith is going to get it, or Keith Cold if you're Justin, um, and we're – you know, I don't want to say we're confident, but we know that somebody like Willie Castro could also get it. Brooks Lee, Jordan Lawler, we have guys that could add it, but we knew Cole Keith would get it. Um, but yeah, right now we have I'm, no second baseman. So I'm great really, playing. well, I'm done, really, guys. yeah, I'm really glad that you uh, said that you guys pretend to be good at fantasy baseball. Oh, of um, course. I mean, obviously, when I'm bringing this up, I, I, I mean, say that we're actually good at it. <laughs> uh, you know, that is that's just one of those, you know, like simple mistakes that you think like when you're coming out of draft, like, hey, this is going to be fine because and again, one of the reasons why I say, especially in draft champions, like stay risk averse. Don't put too many rookies on your team. Yep. Don't put injury risk on your team because you look at you, you look at your roster and you go, well, I got 50 picks like I can spend, you know, a number of them on these prospects, a number of them mm -hmm. on these guys who are injured or injury prone. You don't know when the rash of injuries is going to happen, yep. right? Like we all expect, hey, by August, our, our team is going to be beat up, but we never really expect that that could happen in April. And sometimes it does. And so this is why, like, you know, staying as risk, like you look at the teams that have won the draft champions overall, Rob DiPietro in 2020, uh, Steve Weimers uh, won it. Um, these teams are like ridiculously boring. Like they are boring teams. And they obviously hard. hit later on in the in the in the draft, but sure. like staying risk averse. Um, not to say like you guys weren't risk averse, but you just didn't draft yourself enough second baseman, and now you're in a definitely position. did not. I did it a few years ago in one where like like I drafted Tatis and uh, some other guy at shortstop, and all of a sudden, like in May, because Tatis had the shoulder injury. Uh, mm -hmm. and, the and the other, other guy got, hurt. Got, got hurt. Like I was starting Eric Sogard. <laughs> oh who, no, no, no! <laughs> who is like, like buried on the Brewers' death chart at that? Yeah. Point. And I'm all like, oh, this isn't good. Like now it's May, and I'm starting Eric Sogard for the rest of the year at shortstop. Like that is yeah. that is rough. Yeah I, yeah, I don't know what happened there. Um, you know, we were talking through every pick and everything. And again, we know Keith's going to get it, but we still should have had a third. Yeah. And, um, you know, basically now we need Willie Castro to somehow get it ASAP. But, yeah, we're in trouble for a little bit there until Colt Keith uh, qualifies. But Matt McClain, Keith Cole. off Keith Cole, off our boards right now because uh, ma mainly for me because I already have shares and he's hurt and, and on the IL. If I didn't, I might take the discount. Like I'm not a hundred percent out on, on McLean for the year. And if you have IL slots, I can entertain it. Cause he's going to drop precipitously. It, it, there's already been a big drop. So if it gets to a point where you're comfortable with it, you got three to five IL slots. I I'm still open to McLean in that front in can, the NFC. Be careful. Yes. Can we talk real quick about the guy who is now going from like being an afterthought to like being really really interesting in jonathan india jonathan india jo leading jo off on this team yeah jonathan india has gone from like oh they need to trade him and he's very the, the record chart. i never agreed with i i, I never i, I it was me i that. was definitely saying it um and you weren't the only one so i'm not trying to put it all on you but i never agreed no you can put it all you can put it all on me <laughs> my god it's it's completely my fault um but like he's yeah he's now gone from like being buried on this team like where's jonathan indy gonna play to leading off for this team mm -hmm. he's looked good since returning from his injury this spring now he's a guy that's struggled with injuries uh over the course sure. of his career but like he's one of those guys like hey man like leading off in the best park in baseball in front of a really like like even with their injuries Still a really fun, exciting team. Absolutely. Uh, I love India right now. 
I'm, I'm with you because this price is not shooting up on a crazy level that you can't just go out there and get some India shares and get into that Cincinnati lineup at a very fair price. Pick 230 in the 14 main events. I would pay that. I'd pay even a bit more, to be honest. India's He's a guy. 217 over the course of the last six main event drafts. That's not too bad. I don't think it's yeah. going to jump up a ton more, even with yeah. the McLean injury. So, uh, yeah, keep an eye on Jonathan India for sure. A guy, like you said, was an afterthought. Josh Lowe, and honestly, I had missed this injury, uh, or at least the severity of it, until I just did the exercise this morning with figuring out these ADP shifts because he's down 76 slots from the OCs in February to the main events in March from 79 to 149, and that is surprising to me um because i or excuse me from 73 to 149 there that's that would actually be 76 slots and it is because of this oblique injury and we talk about how we do not like obliques they scare us i don't have word of whether or not he's going to 100 percent be on the il right now yeah he's gonna start the year on the il okay. yeah. it, it, it is for sure yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, oh yeah 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 great grade one oblique strain ain't no way so he's gonna start the season on the il i know that's gonna take him off your board in main events and and things like that Ooh. in the nfbc Oh, is this price point something that you're interested in? Well, because the price point is actually lower than you're saying right now. Because over the course of the last six main event drafts, his ADP is dropped to 196. His min, Ooh. or his min, is 158 right now. Okay, yeah. So I have all 14. You're looking at a more recent, which is good because yeah. I'm glad you're going to have that data. You're going to help us crystallize even more where they've gone most recently um okay so that is interesting then you're talking about a guy who was a breakout star like uh so i'm i'm pro planning and hopefully i will have time i am but i'm planning to do my whole series of this year's blank uh mm -hmm. guys right and i don't know if i'm going to do this one in particular but last year i did this year's adolis garcia which was the guy that the market started to hate so much that he became a value I'll right? be justified one day. Don't, just say my name, bitch. Don't right. fucking sugarcoat it. Don't so, call me the market. My name is Paul Sporer. I stand on 10 toes Paul, about Paul, Adelise Garcia. Paul the market Sporer. <laughs> That's always been my nickname. Uh, on your baseball reference page, we're going to put <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but I felt like Josh Lowe was that dude this year. Like, this is a guy who, like, yeah. had an amazing season um, and, uh, last year. But the market, for some reason, really, and like, yes, for good reason, the market was pushing him down. Like, he struggles with platoon issues. There is swing and miss in his game. Um, but I felt like he was going like outside the top 75 picks, which just had the hate gone too far. Yeah, I think the hate, oh, yeah, so, the so hate, no? I think the hate had gone too far. Um, and now with the injury, he's dropping to a point where, like, yeah, it's an oblique injury. He's, you know, typically you miss like four to six weeks, but a couple of those weeks are going to be still in spring. Mm -hmm. He could be back, or, you know, mid to late April. And you're talking about a guy who is coming off of a monster year and is going to play. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe he platoons some, but he's still going to play. And these, this Rays team does not have the depth in the outfield that it used to. Um, especially Johnny DeLuca dealing with an injury too right now. Which stinks, so, yeah. I did like you him. Know, uh, yeah, I I think I, I'm not a big fan of stashing injured guys, but I think this is a good enough price point if I wanted to stash one injured guy, Josh Lowe is definitely one of the guys I could get. I do appreciate that Like you, you're open to making an exception. Like You're not just so steadfast that you can't possibly – it's all about adjustment. price. Exactly. And now this price is dropping so much to where Josh Lowe's damn near pick 200. And for even four weeks, possibly, even if you missed all of April or, or yeah, it would be all of April there. Five months of Josh Lowe, you finagle six reserve slots because, again, NFBC does not have IL. So you are going to have to deal shorthanded. But the upside of five months of Josh Lowe is probably worth it. And so. And I think I think one of the things you really have to think about when you're making a stash is what is like worst case scenario, right? Mm -hmm. And so for like someone like TJ Friedel, like worst case scenario is there's a he's he's gonna be out for 10 weeks, there's a setback, now he's out for 14 weeks. Um, and with a wrist injury, you're always worried about the potential of the power not coming power back. Savage. Yep. Now with Friedel, it's a little bit different because it's his bottom hand when he's swinging. So 
um, you're not as worried about that. Uh, okay. So, but with a guy like Josh Lowe, you look at the oblique injury, and yes, these ones can be re-aggravated, but usually if they're re-aggravated, you miss another two weeks, and then you're fine and you come back. And typically guys coming back from oblique injuries don't have any long-term issues, right? It's just a muscle strain. You're going to be fine in the long term. Mm -hmm. So, like, that's an injury that while it sucks and you don't want to see it because you know that it's, you know, a four- to six-week timetable or a six- to eight-week timetable, depending on the severity, um, ultimately – uh, these guys end up coming back and being the guys they were prior to the injury right away once they are back. Uh, so, like, I don't mind taking that gamble on a guy like Josh Lowe. It's one of the reasons why we were talking about Johan Duran yesterday. I don't mind taking the gamble on Johan Duran if the price is right. And right now, for me, Josh Lowe's price is right. Okay. I think that makes a lot of sense, and I, I can totally understand Saying like, okay, I'm not fully out here because of the upside that I can still get. And again, it all comes down to price. Uh, we can love a player, but if their price is too high, uh, then we move off of them. We've, we've done yep. that plenty of times. I talk about Joe Ryan being a guy like that, who I've loved, loved, loved. Now all of a sudden he's picked 75 and I'm just going to take Bailey over or wait in another 100 picks and take Louis Varland. Um, all right, let's talk some main event ADP shifts. And again, you've got it pulled up so that you can give us even more detailed. Uh, but I'm going with all 14 main events and again, comparing them to the February Rotowire Online Championships. That's 12 team, but it does have waivers and an overall component, 40 different drafts to the 15 team main event, 15 teams, waiver wire overall component what we mean by overall component is you're not just competing against your league but you're in a giant league with all x number of hundred participants for a big prize and so it does change the way you draft you can't purpose i mean you you can i guess if you want but you should not punt a category you may have to in season like you can win with a weak category it's happened before but you shouldn't go in trying to do that yeah. you should be trying to be competitive across the 10 categories and let's just say your save specs don't work out and you just don't have enough saves then you start pivoting and over indexing on the other categories but if you, you go in punting you're almost certainly not going to win the main you're definitely not going to win the main um there's just too many teams and taking a zero in any particular category there's not just necessarily too... zero but even like you know 40 but, points when when you when there's like finish, 800 yeah fin when you've got 800 teams in an overall like you can't you can't get like you know so few amount of saves or so few amount of stolen bases that it puts you at the complete bottom of the standings like just you need to finish in like the 50th percentile at worst in like one of the 10 categories you can't yeah. finish in like the 20th percentile and expect to win the overall no ex exactly that and so that's why uh we, we don't advocate anything like that uh and so keep that in mind so first things first ronald acuna has gone first in all 14 um are you surprised by that no spencer strider at one i obviously we've gotten great news um, on acuna he's back where do you come out on that i'm really surprised honestly especially and it's nothing to do with acuna um, I totally understand why everybody is taking Acuna first overall. He is kind of a cheat code mm -hmm. in fantasy with his just power speed combination. Um, even if you cut off some of the steals from last year because you say, oh, well, maybe he's a little bit more careful in the base pass, uh, given the injury, like like he's still a cheat code. Like, you know, you're you're talking about a guy who could easily be 40-40, um, you know, without much of a problem. So uh I get why he has gone first overall. For me, it's the overall state of the upper tier of pitching like we've had a number of injuries including garrett cole who's going to be like a mid first rounder in the main event yep. go out and so like if i was picking first overall i'd probably take strider um it, it does surprise me but i think people might be just be looking at the projections and how aggressive they are yeah how much higher acuna is than everybody and they say man i just can't ignore this insane advantage that he gives but to your point you're saying strider now might be giving the same advantage because the upper tier pitchers that are getting hurt yuri perez you know maybe not upper upper tier but that next level garrett cole out for a while um so now you go from strider to burns at, at the one two does he not offer a major edge there and maybe it's not it's just not been big enough for people because they're not jumping and um, to Strider I, yet. I get it. You know, one of the things that I've talked about, um, because the two places that I've gotten Acuna this year has been in auctions um, at Tau Wars and at Labor. And like all the injury stuff came out while I was in Florida at Labor. Mm -hmm. And um, I went into that auction and I went, okay, like how am I going to approach potentially going after Ronald Acuna? 
And so what I did was I took off like 125 plate appearances from Acuna. He was still worth four dollars <laughs> more than the next player in my that's projections. So filthy like, man, he's like, so and, the, good. and so that's why like Acuna is going so much higher. Is like even if you cut off 100 plate appearances, like he's still worth more than everybody. So yeah. um, uh, I totally get it. I do think that this, especially in the main event, which is a 15 team league. So like if you're picking first overall, you've got to wait till 30 to make your next pick. Mm-hmm. And the way we we're seeing like kind of the the second tier of starting pitchers, all the guys after Spencer Strider, Strider's a tier of by himself, in my opinion, at least. Agreed. Uh, those guys are getting pushed up. And which makes it, like, because before, like, when you were taking, you know, Cunha one overall, you could double tap two really good starting pitchers on the two, three turn. I think that's much harder to do now. Um, and those people that really like to go hitter, hitter, hitter from the one spot, like, that could be a disaster in the four or five rounds. Um, and that's what happened in my main event last year where I started four straight hitters. By the time it got back to me in the fifth round, I was like, oh, I don't like any of these pitchers anymore. <laughs> like, so uh, no, I is going to be my ace now. Yeah. Uh, I totally understand why people are going Acuna. I think I, if I was in that position, I'm not going to be. I'm picking eight in my main. Um, I would probably go with Spencer Strider. I don't know how many there are tomorrow. I think there's upwards of like 12 uh, main event drafts, but do we see a Strider number one tomorrow in your opinion? I think there's probably closer to 15 main event drafts tomorrow, okay. but um, I think there will be one league at least where he goes one, but I, I, I also I so wouldn't too. be surprised if he didn't. Yeah. It, I know. And I know that sounds a little fence city from us. Like, Oh uh, yes, but no, I do think there will be, I will say yes. If we come back on Monday and we say he did not go number one at all, Strider did, uh, then I, w- I will say, yeah, I, I I understand, but I did think somebody would take the plunge. Uh, one, of the things, go one, ahead. Of the th- one of the things about, like, these main event drafts that are going on tomorrow, there's going to be one room with, like, seven or eight main event drafts. There's yes. always somebody that wants to make people talk about them. Of course. Like, it's almost like an industry draft, and, like, one of the things, you know, I talk about in industry drafts is – there's always people that go, I'm going to like do a look at me pick. I'm going to do a pick that people are going to talk about because then they're going to talk about me. Um, I, me, me, me. I assume somebody will make a pick first overall that people go, what were you doing? You think it might not be Strider or Acuna? Is somebody going to go go Mookie Betts and be like, he's shortstop now, so I had to do it. I'm just saying – when we see on Sunday that main event ADP kind of populate mm-hmm. from those Saturday drafts, I think there is going to be somebody that did something crazy. We will cover it on Monday if if and when it does yep. happen because we're going to definitely talk main events on Monday. Um, the biggest jump up in the top 100, probably unsurprising because there's just no way he doesn't make the team. I don't know if he's fully announced yet. I will look that up. He is not. He's, okay, but uh, – <laughs> How would it not? If Wyatt Langford doesn't make the team, I'm going to explode. Not because I have a bunch of him, just because I don't know. You can't say something's a meritocracy, watch him do this, and then not bring him north. Uh, I mean, you know what I mean. Then Especially with north. all their injuries right now. like Exactly. They kind of like, need him. How 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 is this headline on Rotoware now saying he could make the opening? It's, shut shut up with your coulds. Uh, he's unbelievable. He's up sixty picks to pick eighty two with a min of sixty seven. I know you have some Wyatt Langford shares, which means you mm-hmm. might not be interested in getting more now that the price is elevated. But even at the elevated price, like I totally get it. He's so awesome that like. I'm not fully out, even though I wasn't taking a bunch of Langford. I ended up with a couple shares because he dropped. But now even at the elevated price, I, I'm i entertaining it. Where do you stand on Wyatt Langford? I have a really hard time pulling the trigger on these kind of guys. This is why I like to draft early, because I get a couple shares of guys that I know are going to be top 60 picks mm-hmm. um, before they're in the top 100. And so good, though. Isn't he this year's Corbin Carroll in terms of, like, going Yeah, this super year's high. Bobby Witt or this year's, yeah. you know. Julio like the Ryan. bankable, yeah. real, like, legit prospect that, like, I don't want to say how does he fail because, of course, anybody can fail. Every, like, everybody can fail. Um, of course. But it doesn't seem very likely that Wyatt Langford isn't going to be a – a successful player and and the floor even like if it's not peak 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 should still be pretty good right yeah i mean i definitely think well no i i don't think the floor can be 
it has to necessarily be good because we have seen these prospects fail. And so the floor has to be back in AAA getting you zero stats. What's the uh, likelihood of that though? No, no, let's talk about that. Yes, everyone has that floor, right? Anyone can flop. We've seen it across, like Alec Manoa, we never would have thought would explode the way he did. I understand that, but what's the percentage chance of that realistically? Pretty low, I would think. I think it's probably closer to like 40%. There is no way that that is, I, I don't know how to quantify that, obviously. We're talking theoreticals. But I Derek Cardi had a really, really good tweet about, um, and I know like Derek, Derek Cardi hates himself. prospects. He does. And he, I love he, Derek Cardi, by the way. I'm not shading. It, yeah. Him. No, I love Derek Cardi too. And, but like, and part of it, I think, was he was trying to stir the pot a little bit because, yeah. you know, as much as Derek is like the nicest, like, you know, the very kind of humble, he's quiet an assassin, guy, like, though, dude. He, he will he sneak is, start yeah, he shit. Will, he will destroy people. Um, but he he tweeted something out about like, hey, top five prospects coming that were debuting in Major League Baseball and how they did historically. And there's like a 50 percent flop rate. Um, Who are so they? I I'd have find that. the tweet while we're talking about this, because okay. I want to know how old this is, too, because it's, we're in a different era now, too. And I do think, you know, OK, I think people would point people are probably screaming at their at their phone right now. Uh, what about Anthony Volpe? You know, because he was a top 100 guy into the top 75 in some of the drafts. And all he he did 2020, but he hit 209. So that wasn't very good. I, I grant that. And I'm not saying that Wyatt Langford's untouchably perfect or anything. I'm not even somebody who takes all these guys. So please don't mistake me for being like super aggro here. I'm just saying like, man, this guy looks like the real deal that can at the very least go, I don't know. I don't want to say the very least. I know the floor is bad. Everyone's floor is bad. But if he goes like 245, 2015, yeah, that's not what you wanted at that pick. But like that doesn't kill you either. And I think that's kind of in line with what I think he might might be close to his kind of negative outcome. I don't know. I'm I'm all over the place right now. But I just I'm, I don't really think he's a huge huge risk. Wyatt Langford. I, I will send you the tweet. But there's so many names on this. That, okay. Like, okay. I I didn't, really I didn't know hard. if it was just a few names or not. Yeah. Send it um, over. I want to take a look. So, but What's the, like, how, what kind of era does it span though? Um, this one is from 2009, 2023, but I think what okay. it, but in, in it's, it's like a, uh, it's like a spreadsheet screenshot. What do the um, last like 10 look like though? Cause I feel like well, maybe, maybe did, that's my, my problem though, is I feel like it's getting better. Maybe I'm full of shit on that. Well, and like he, like he said, like he, he shares the screenshot of the spreadsheet, um, but then he also uh, he also says like you know kind of the typing it out like partiality mostly prospect struggle hit initially for every Corbin Carroll there are three Volpe Torkelson Walker types like that's fair you know Jared Kelnick last or you know in his first uh, year, everyone like, knew everyone knew Jared Kelnick so uh, I can't believe anybody that's knew. that's not true don't 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 confuse no of course because you didn't yeah no because you did I'm messing around okay. I think here's the thing. I think Jordan Walker is a good, good name to say though, because that's what I that's what I'm thinking with Wyatt Langford. And Jordan Walker was not awesome last year. I fully, fully grant that. That's a fact. I, I, I whether I grant it or not, it remains a fact. He went 16-7, 276, 51, 51. Which is fine, but when we start talking about guys getting into the top sixty picks, like Walker I never got into that. that. Like. Yeah, it's, he was more of a uh, eighty to one hundred and ten type guy. And like, so if, like if that one, if that guy flops, you go, well, that sucks. But you know what? It doesn't kill me. But when you start taking these guys in the top sixty, in the top forty-five, we're talking first three to four rounds of a fifteen-team draft, you're passing on established elite talent, mm -hmm. like guys who have shown over the course of years that they can hit the major league level, like. Just looking at like the last, you know, six drafts, guys going between 45 and 60 are Jose Altuve, Randy Rosarena. Um, I'm going to skip O'Neill Cruz. <laughs> um, then, well, a lot, a hell of a lot of pitchers. Dolis Garcia, uh, Jazz Chisholm, Cody Bellinger. Like, I'm going to take now. I would take Langford, I think, maybe over a couple of those guys. Like, why am I going to take Royce Lewis that high, who's got an injury history, hasn't because really proven at the major league level he can do it 
on a full I, I think he's shown more established skill. I, I would take I would take Royce. I can understand the argument, but I can also understand the argument of going, well, I'm gonna take the guy who I am pretty sure is at least gonna be healthy in Wyatt Langford. Um, but like I how do you take think... him over Cody Ballinger? Like, I just don't fair, I can't do that. Like, so fair. for me, like I as much as I think Wyatt Langford is gonna be good. I think the risk profile in terms of like, I know Cody Ballinger, as long as he's healthy, is going to be on the field. Mm -hmm. I don't know that's the case for White Langford. Like I, you know, it is a very crowded outfield situation. They will get healthy. A lot of these guys are expected back. I mean, Corey Seager might be ready for opening day. Josh Young might be ready for opening day. Nate Lowe is probably going to be ready a few weeks into the season. Like all of a sudden that team becomes crowded again and they don't need White Langford. And if he's not hitting at the end of April, if he's hitting a buck 34, uh, that be very cool. Then he's going back down to triple a and all of a sudden you've wasted your fourth round draft. pick. Yeah. I mean, it's a six month season. I wouldn't say you waste it. Well, unless you cut him, I guess, uh, in that well, point, that in, in be, especially in the NFBC context, you probably yeah. have to cut him. I don't think most people would. Some people I don't would. Think so either. Phil, Phil Dussault would, you know, and I, 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 I point that out as a positive. I'm not roasting him. I'm saying like he knows, to, like he is definitive with his moves. He does not want to hold a roster spot. You know, his big move was cutting uh, Degrom when it seemed when a lot of people weren't ready to do that. He said, "Nope, this it has to be the move right now," um, and it helped him. That that wasn't during his dream season, and so no, I I, I get it. I, I do. I do. And I'm, I don't want to be seen as like the guy like overly advocating for um, White Langford because for most of the offseason, I've been saying, be careful with this. This is people are going crazy with it. The one and thing I will the say craziness is, is here. The, the craziness is absolutely here, even more so than I thought it was earlier. The one thing I will say is looking at this list, a lot of these guys that failed on this prospect list, I think White Langford is better than. Yeah, I mean, here's my only argument against that. Because I, I don't necessarily think you're wrong. I do think that, A, maybe your your memory of how good they were coming up is colored by how well they've been or how well they've played. That is fair. Good or bad at the I major league level. I also don't agree um, by, by putting... I don't know. He's probably going off dollar value. I'm, I'm going to trust Derek more often than not, yeah. uh, just because he's a smart and guy. I don't he goes by the data, but like, reason, I don't. What I don't, I'm not going to retweet the list because one, I don't want the like overwhelming hate that comes from retweeting something <laughs> like that. But two, because I don't love the sample size in terms. Wit of went twenty thirty. Twenty thirty two fifty four. I don't think with eighty ribbies, eighty runs. I don't think he underperformed. I, I don't, oh no, and I I don't think every player on this list is an underperformance for sure. Um, yeah, like, and that that's just one that that he put on there that I'm like, okay, I don't I don't fully agree with that, but he's probably going by dollar value relative to the yeah. draft pick, and I understand that. When I took wit, and maybe maybe I'm just being uh, defensive because I took wit, but I'm looking at the auction calculator right now. He's a twenty three dollar player, and I took him in the fourth round. What what's wrong with that? No, nothing. And like, I don't think Anthony Volpe last year is necessarily underperformed too. I think the two hundred nine does really kill him. But it, the two hundred nine I mean, considering you weren't like you weren't taking him in the top fifty, like he was taking going, him in the top seventy five. I don't think he was going in the top seventy five last oh, year. Oh, I think so. If we can get him in, and by the auction calculator, he was negative five dollars because of that batting average. Oh wow, Anthony okay. Volpe. Yeah, That's yeah. what two hundred nine does to you. So again, we don't need to parse it. Um, I agree but, with your general points here, and that's why I want to be clear. I'm so not the, saying take White Langford that high. Go ahead. I'm the, sorry. The other point that I uh, want to make is we don't have a very large sample size of Wyatt Langford. Like, no, don't forget, like, like he was drafted and last summer, last year, like he yeah. was drafted in June yeah. and then went on this amazing tear through the minor leagues that is now putting him in a position to make the majors the year after he was drafted. Like at least small samples are still small samples. Now it's exactly. an elite small sample. I tiny. think I do think he's going to be really, really good. But you, like I said, yeah, it is tiny. Like at least when I took Bobby Witt, he had a had a full season of excellence yeah. at double and triple A yep. in 2021. So no, totally agree. Again, we're just kind of batting it around here. I want to be clear. I'm not telling y'all to go pay that premium for Wyatt Langford because I don't really believe 
that I want to either. So I don't want to send y'all in there to battle thinking, you know, for some reason you listen to my takes all the time. Spore said it. I'm going to do it too. No, because I'm not going to come out with him tomorrow. I can guarantee you that. But he now, is the highest like, mover. His ADP in the last six are pretty is pretty much 80. I can make the argument for it. I don't know that I'm going to do it. What's the difference between 60 and 80? I mean, it's a 20 lot. picks, but like it's a round. I don't know. It, I mean, I don't think because this, in order to do it, you're passing up on Christian Yelich. Wait, 82 is higher. I, I said he moved up 60 picks to 82. And so if, if he's 80, then he's actually moving up incrementally. Well, no, because I, I, yeah, and I, and I was, I was mostly speaking about him in terms of, uh, like, I think he, I think by the time you and oh, I draft, oh, like, I think he's going to, that he's going to be top 50. Like, I think, yeah. you know, like, I think I think that he's one of those guys that I think somebody's I think multiple people are going to take him in the first four rounds. Uh, and I just can't do that. I think so, too. And I also cannot do that with Wyatt Langford. All right, let's yeah. keep moving on. Then uh, one of the reasons he might not move up is because exactly what we say happens is happening again this year. This is kind of a known thing in the NFBC main event specifically. The next 17 biggest risers after Mr. Langford are all pitchers moving up an average of 23 spots 32 of the top 36 upward movers are pitchers some of the big ones some dumbasses are probably not shutting the hell up about bailey over and thus he's up 40 picks let's talk about our boy i've been a fan for a long time you joined the train this year with your uh, stunning projection which i don't disagree with by the way i don't call it stunning because i think it's bad but you're fully in he is now within the top 100. He's still cheaper than Joe Ryan. So my my case of like, why take Joe Ryan when you can get Bailey Ober still exists. But now it's only a two round difference instead of a four to six round difference. Are you still in on your boy Bailey Ober as a top 100 pick? Man. Um... <laughs> Look what you did to yourself and me. Look what you did to us. I, I had to mute myself because I'm starting to choke up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> So I jumped on the bandwagon late. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, usually when people jump on the bandwagon late, they just kind of quietly sit in the rear of the train and just kind of enjoy grabbing. You busted chairs. up to the front through the conductor and took yeah. over the, the reins. I did an old school train robbery here <laughs> and I am now controlling this train. Uh, I'm the captain now. <laughs> yeah. Look at me. I'm the captain now uh so yeah I, I love bailey over and uh like it i i you know i don't know how much influence you and i've had in terms of his adp rising oh yeah yeah we're, we're here for that. it yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're totally here for it um and like yeah so one of the things that i will say is um and i'm hoping none of my main event competitors um are listening necessarily right now but i treat I treat a lot of early snake drafts by kind of gauging where the market is and playing the market ADP game. Mm -hmm. I treat my later drafts much more like an auction. And I say that to mean my value is my value. I throw ADP up. Uh, get my guy. Yeah. Yep. So if you want over, take him in the third round. There you go. There it is, folks. Bailey Ober. He is moving on up, and we are here for it. That is somebody that I am going to be sticking with. Um, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to get him tomorrow, but it's somebody that I'm not moving off of because of this move. I really believe in him. I think he's a great pitcher, and if he can quell the home runs at all, I think an ace potential season is uh, on the table at least. Chris Sale's up 38 picks. That's a big jump. Uh, Chris Sale now in the top 100, um, sitting here at 82 Obviously, we know Chris Sale has the talent. It all comes down to the health, which is, I'm sure, what you're going to highlight when I ask you how you feel. But he's healthy right now. Are you comfortable taking the shot on Chris Sale? Um, man, this is this is a really tough price for Chris Sale. Um, I love no Chris discount. Sale, but like I can't take him over Justin Steele. Um, okay, I can't take him over Bailey over. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't take him over Tanner Bybee. Um, He's having a brilliant spring, I will just say, 27% strikeout minus walk with a casual 29% swing. And he's on rate. one of the best teams in baseball, so you know exactly. he's going to get win potential. Um, exactly. Yeah, maybe I need to kind of – like, 
I think, like I said yesterday, like a good portion of my day to day is going to be updating projections, and maybe mm-hmm. I need to update his a little bit as well. So, um, right now, I don't think I can pay the price, but I completely understand why people are. Um, and I'm a little bummed because I don't think I have Kurt Sale in any leagues. Uh, so maybe I make the decision like, hey, I don't, I don't have him in a single league. Um, maybe I make the decision here in one of these next six drafts where I go, you know, I need a little Chris Sale in my life and I'm going to take the gamble, but, uh, I'm not in line with ADP. I just, I think the, the reason it's funny because like, like, I feel like coming into the draft season, I was like the guy going, Hey, like he's always been good when he's been healthy. Like, I think this is a great opportunity to buy him Chris Sale. I never got the opportunity to. Yeah. And now like all of a sudden, like. I'm looking like, oh, now it's not a good time. Like his ADP is way too high. Like, uh, so I may have just kind of missed my opportunity to buy early. Uh, and I'm okay if that's the case. I hope Chris Sale's good. There's nothing, or there's very few things better in baseball than a healthy Chris Sale. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's a fun I, watch. You know, he, you know, he's one of those guys that I will enjoy watching. I'll enjoy playing in DFS, but I, I have a really hard time believing I'm going to end up with him in any league. I'm not out. But a lot of the names you mentioned, you know, he, he might need to be closer to that 98 max that Chris yeah. Sale has had in the uh, in the main event for me to get in. 82 average and 76 min, probably not. But he, he's still on my board. I will say that. I've not removed I mean, him from 98 the board. Max, 98 max in the last six main event drafts um, puts him, if that was his ADP, would put him in between – Bailey Ober and Tanner Bybee. Um, I like all three of those guys. Shane Bieber, right there, and I like him too. So he's on. He's in. That, yeah, that, that puts just that puts uh, Chris Sale right in the mix then, because I like all four of those guys quite a bit. You know where and I think so... I could end up with Chris Sale? That, um, I mean, this is unfortunate for you and unfortunate for a lot of people who don't play auctions. I think in an auction I could do it. Yeah, more control because... over everything. Uh, you know, the way I like to build my pitching staff in auctions tends to be I miss out on the elite guys, but I roster like four or five of these like four, you know, tier four pitchers. Um, and I could roster a Bailey Ober and a Tanner Bybee and Chris Sale on the same roster where you can exactly. never do that in a draft because they're all going to go around the same spot. You could take two of those if you want yeah. to go pitcher pitcher there, but yeah, you're right. So no, I, I I totally hear that. Yeah, I'm not in the auction game as much anymore. Nothing against them. I love auctions; they're wonderful. That's that's what a draft, strength. baby. Yeah, yeah, and it's a major strength of yours. So I totally understand why you continue to play those. You had an excellent year last year, and I hope you have a good one this year because it wouldn't affect me. I can I can cheer you on all the way there. Whenever I say I hope you do well in the main event, it's a pure lie, right? Because obviously yeah. I want you to do absolutely. It. <laughs> Actually, You'll I want you to win your league. I just don't want you to beat me in the main. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a pure lie. It's just uh, it, it has it has conditions to it. Let's say. Next up is Cole Reagans. He's up twenty nine picks. Thanks a lot, Nick. That's uh, that's the best I got there. Uh, he, he's up big. Obviously, Nick Pollock uh, helping drive that train. Uh, we have not been shy about speaking of the exploits of of Cole Reagans as well. His average ADP is sixty eight. Are we ready to do that? Is he ready to be basically you know a second a second tier guy, a number two guy? Uh, for you three if you're going crazy pitching but he's more or less going to be the sp1 or two on the majority of teams no you know it's crazy i have zero cole reagan shares this year no um, cole reagan's i do have some so if i if i don't get them it's it's okay it's and for me it's less about like his overall price but all the other guys that i think are undervalued yeah. going right around the same spot as him like i mean i love zach Eflin. um me and too. so like you know, like I've just been getting a lot of Zach Eflin and it's really, really interesting to me because like Tariq's or Tarek, Tarek, Tarek Skubal. Tarek. I've been trying Tariq. to get yeah. myself back on it too. I, I say Tariq all the time. Tarek Skubal like automatically was put into like the elite tiers of starting pitching mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning. Based of on 80 innings. Yeah. But Cole Reagan's because he had like that one bad outing where he like fell down and couldn't find the strike yep. zone like was placed like into uh, like two tiers below him. And now we're starting to see him get into that kind of, you know, move into the same kind of tier as that's Skubal. a great point. Um, I think this is just like a delayed reaction where people mm-hmm. went like, 
oh, you know, we were overinflating Cole Reagans on a small sample, and now people are like seeing him in spring and going, maybe we should have been doing that. No, we um, weren't. He looks yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And don't who cares about the 540 ERA? 29% K rate, 5% walk rate. 28% swinging strike rate. Reagan's looks pitching in Kansas again. City yeah. in that amazing park and on a team that's going to be better. Like, like uh, that Toronto yeah. thing could have been purely the mound, right? Like we freaked yeah. out about it. He was fine after. If that was the last thing that we saw, like let's say that was his last start, I could understand why people be like, oh, what the hell was that all about? Is this the beginning of some yips? He was fine. So, uh, but you're right. I do think it was influencing Cole Reagan's early draft stock. And now here he is moving up, up, up. Minimum of 54. Um, you like other guys around. What do you think his min is on Monday when we look at it? Nick Pollock's not in the main event. Um, I think his min is inside the top 45. I think someone I was, takes I was going to say round. 35. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. Um, Craig Kimbrell. Let's shift to closer real quick. We've been talking about all these closers uh, getting murked as we did on yesterday's episode, which stinks. Craig Campbell's a guy, we have history. I tried to talk, I not tried. I did talk you out of him the year he bounced back big time. Uh, whoops, but I'm nervous. He is now a top 100 pick because he quietly had a solid season last year. And even as a little hater ass bitch myself, I have to acknowledge Craig Campbell did pretty well last year in Philadelphia. Still a 10% walk rate, but 34% K, 326 ERA, 104 whip with 23 saves. And now he's going to Baltimore, another great team. And I think he's more the unencumbered guy, especially obviously with Bautista out. Yanir Cano might get an occasional save when Kimbrell's tired, but I think Kimbrell could get back to 30 plus saves, which he hasn't done since 2018, just because Baltimore's going to be great. And I don't think he's really getting challenged. Are you in on Kimbrell as a top 100 guy? I have a really hard time. Like I just have these like visions of Craig, uh, Craig Kimbrell just like blowing up. And um, what if I talked you into him and then he flopped this year to bring to go you're, you're not, goal. you're not going no, to talk me not at that price stuff. point. I just, I can't do it. Like I no, just like too expensive, especially because he's on a team that is really poised to like take over the American league East. Like they, yeah. they won it last year. Um, Man, I really wish they had signed Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery. I guess they could still sign Jordan Montgomery. They could, yeah. Um, I don't think they're going to. Like they, they could have like sale in order. I think once that finishes, maybe they'd be more open to. I don't think it's official yet with the sale. Oh, maybe not. So, uh, because they could have just put the nail in the coffin of that of that division uh, with I think one of those guys. Um, mm -hmm. But because they're so, their team that needs to compete, it is such a competitive division. Uh, I don't think he's got a super long leash. I think if That's he turns point. back into Craig Kimbrell of the last few years where he's struggled, um, that Yanir Cano is a really, really good reliever, and he was the closer once Batista went down last year. Like mm -hmm. They can easily make that switch. They can also easily go acquire a closer That's on the, the trade thing. market because they've got such great minor league depth. They go get David um, Bednar like really yeah. easily if if things blew up and Cano wasn't didn't hold up mm -hmm. and Kimbrell fell apart. Yeah, you, you're right there. And again, at this price point, I can't do it. Now, before yeah. this, before the surge, when he was like around 120, then I was taking my hater ways uh, away from Craig Kimbrell and saying, okay, maybe I could. But now he's a firm top 100 guy. His max is 102, so he barely ever gets out of the top 100. He might go up even more this weekend because there's even more closer issues right now. Yeah. Um, and so what, what's his recent, uh, is it higher than 86 right now for Craig Kimbrell in those last four five, six drafts that you've been looking at? Because that's, uh, yeah, that's the he, part that scares me. He's, he's 84 right now. Okay. So incrementally the, up the max is 91. So he's not getting out of the top 100 anymore. Um, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. I'm do too either. scared. I'm a little yeah, scared. Cat. Especially right, when you start looking at like, um, I'm, you know, huh? well, it's the injured ones that go right. Were you going to say the yeah. ones that go right after him? Yeah. Uh huh. I'd rather wait a while and get Albert Alzale. Um, yeah, I think I just go elsewhere. I'll I'll have one. I should have a closer by the time Kimbrel goes, and then I don't want him as my number two. Not that he wouldn't be a fine number two at a better price point, but then yeah, it's a bunch of the injured guys, and so yeah, Alzale at around pick one twenty. I think I'd rather just take that gamble. Yeah, me too. Okay, let's obviously when players go up, some people have to come down. And unsurprisingly, 
20 of the 24 biggest drops are hitters, and all four of the pitchers are hurt. They're the closers we talked about, Duran, Romano, and Bednar, as well as Kevin Gosman. So no surprises there, right? Um, the biggest drop is Mike Trout. So when we got asked, are you worried about Mike Trout leading the league in strikeouts in spring? And we definitively said no with a little bit of a chuckle because we were not moved by that. Turns out maybe some folks are because he's down 26 picks, uh, still within the top 100. All these players so far are in the top 100, but down to pick 80 with a max of 97. I don't know where you were on Trout before this. Um, I've been in. This obviously only strengthens my resolve because he's cheaper, and I'm not, and I am not worried about the K's in spring. I'm really, really not. Yeah, um, I was willing to take him, especially if he fell in a draft. And when I say fell, like moved outside of the top like 75 picks. Well, here you um, go. Yeah, like Mike Trout's on my board for sure. Like I just, I'm sorry. Like if if Mike Trout is healthy, he is a first round pick. Exactly, like, and like to get him this late. Um, now, if you draft him, you want to be very risk averse with a lot of your other picks. Like certainly I'm not going to draft him and then go in stash Josh Lowe. Right. Yeah. Or if um, I've already got Royce Lewis. You yeah. Know, I got some other injury risk around. Like I'm not trying to go. All, I'm not going to don't compound the, the risk, yeah. but Mike Trout is still Mike Trout. And yeah. one of the things our good buddy and co host on this podcast has been talking about, is looking at some of these teams with new managers and how you didn't much say who it was. You're talking about Jason Collette. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about Jason Collette. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, who did people think I was going to say? Like, Fair. There really yeah. is only other one person. Yeah. Fair enough. You're right. Um, You're right. But he's been like, kind of tracking like the stolen base numbers for teams with new managers, mm -hmm. and the Angels are running a lot. They're now, running wild. I don't know if Mike Trout, and I haven't even looked to see if Mike Trout's like attempted a stolen base in spring one or anything. One. one for um, one. But what would happen if Mike Trout started running again? It's over. Like it's over. all of all of a sudden we go from a guy like, hey, if he stays healthy, he's a first rounder, to if he stays healthy, he is a top five pick. Yeah. Um, and we're getting him like outside of the top 90 picks. That's where I'm at, Trout. man. Like yeah. it, it's Mike Trout still, and I understand that you know because I put him in my breakouts article, which felt so weird to be putting Mike <laughs> freaking Trout in there. Uh, but again, that that's just an article of guys that I like past their price point or, or more than their price point, and uh, obviously I really like Trout. And so he might be um, good one day. He well, could break I, I got out. an inkling. I got yeah. an inkling on this guy here. Keep an eye on this Trout guy out in LA, and I know that you know he had just a 134 WRC plus last year. That's his career low, and it's a 134. That's 34% better than league average with 18 bombs that if you do the, the extrapolation, which we always advise against, but if you do the 600 plate appearance extrapolation, still 30 homers. Yeah. And like you said, if he does start running a little bit, and I don't think he would go crazy and steal like 25, 30, but even if I got 12 to 14 out of him, that would be a boon. For Mike Trout, because right now if, I'm penciling him in for four. Two, if you've got 30, 10, 300. That'd be, be God tier at that price point. Isn't that like what we want from Mookie Betts? Absolutely. You know, no, so like that, that's why I'm just so in uh, on Trout and to see that he's one of the the guys going down with everyone, with all the pitchers moving up. That pleases me greatly. Uh, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. So that's where I'm at with Mike Trout for sure. Let's move on to Paul Goldschmidt. Another oldie, uh, actually much older guy, five years older, Paul Goldschmidt, uh, getting down a whole round, down 15 picks. Where do we stand on Goldie? We haven't really talked much about him this offseason. Pick 94 on average, going as late as 104. He has a pretty tight range, but uh, he's dipped 15 picks, one of the bigger droppers within the top 100. Does that intrigue you at all? Yeah, because he is a guy like in a down year, he had 25 home runs, 11 mm -hmm. stolen bases, and hit 268. Like, I even if he just repeats that, I feel like he's giving you back, you know, you know, halfway decent value. But like, there's no reason to think like he can't get back to like being a 30 10 guy with like a 300 batting average. Um, and like, one of the things that really hurt his value last year was just the Cardinals. The Cardinals were yeah. a mess. Like, he had 89 runs scored and 80 RBIs. The two previous seasons, he was pretty much bankable for 100-100. Like, so, yep. 
I would think he gets back to the hundred hundred um, and, you know, back to like, you know, upper twenties, low thirties home runs uh, and the batting average uh, comes back up, uh, you know, a little bit to like the 280, 290 area. Like I think Paul Goldschmidt is a really fine value um, with where he's going. Yeah, I have no problem. I didn't really have a problem with his standard ADP. And now that you're telling me I'm going to get him cheaper, thank you. Um, I'll, 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 I'll take that. I, I don't really have a problem with the Cardinals hitters. I think, you guys know. Go ahead. I think one of the reasons why he drops isn't to do with him as much as it is to do with the first base pool. Like, there is a lot of really interesting guys um, and bankable guys going late in the first base pool. Mm-hmm. And when pitchers have to rise, when closers have to rise, yeah. somebody's somebody has to fall. come down. First baseman, I think, are falling. I think that's a great, great way to put it there. So it's not really some goldy hate. It's just a byproduct of uh, because somebody has to come down. And so an yeah. older first baseman at a position that's deep all of a sudden comes down. Here's an interesting one. And this is a guy I talked a lot about last year, kind of j- joining the train on Nico Horner. Somebody I had never, I didn't dislike him, but I always had a blind spot for him. I just kind of ranked him relatively around where the ADP was and never gave him really a second thought. And then I mentioned that I had been watching a bunch of early Cubs games because there were some starters I really liked, like Steele and Hayden Wesneski. Sorry if you joined me on that train. That one did not work. At least Steele did. Um, And so I was watching all these Cubs games, and all of a sudden I'm looking at this guy, and I'm like, man, he's a a player, man. He's a lot lot of fun to watch. I really appreciated what Nico Horner was able to do. I will say that has not now translated into a bunch of shares of him, but he's second and short eligible. Only hit nine homers, but 43 steals, 283 average, 98 runs last year. He's down a full round, down to pick 71. That is giving me some interest now, especially my boy Matt McClain going out. Not that they do the exact same things, but like a, a middle infielder. I'm I'm a little interested now here in Nico Horner. It is a little dicey. What? I'm what eating right eating? now. I'm you, eating you... all the shares of Nico Okay, Horner. that's what I thought you were saying. Like, I wasn't sure yeah. if you were saying let... – okay, go ahead. So talk let, to us let, about Nico Horner see, then. Baby. Uh, I understand, like, there has been a lot of pushback on Nico Horner being drafted as early as he has been this draft season. Um, but I think they're wrong. I think they're absolutely wrong. I think people are looking at this profile and going, oh, like, you can't bank on 50 stolen bases, you know, can't bank on the batting average. Why not? Nico Horner is an elite, elite, and I'm not being hyperbolic here, elite back-to-ball skills. We're talking Mm -hmm. like mid-90s zone contact. uh, 5% swing strike rate last year. Like, the dude puts the ball in play all the time. And when you do that, you give yourself the opportunity to get lucky. You give yourself to... Especially when you have speed. Yeah, you give yourself the opportunity to run really high babbits. Um I love I love guys like this. Uh, he's going to be leading off in front of a really good lineup in Chicago. Uh, he's got a, plenty of speed. He's not a zero in terms of power in the way that you know other kind of guys of this profile are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not going to get a ton of home runs. Like I don't even think I have him projected for double digits. I think I have him projected for like eight or nine. Yeah, uh, but you're going to get a crap ton of runs scored. You're going to get a crap ton of stolen bases uh, and like. I I love drafting guys with batting average early, especially in the context of overall leagues. But just generally speaking, when you want to stay balanced, because it allows you to take guys that may sap your batting average later, right? Exactly. Drafting, you build a cushion. You look at like what I did in my TGFBI draft, and I started with Freddie Freeman in the first round, and in the fourth round, I got Nico Horner. And then all of a sudden, like, I could take a Jake Berger. I could take a Kyle Schwarber. Like, I could take these guys that may be batting average drains and still be able to kind of handle that because I've got two guys who are going to get 700 plate appearances with a 300 batting average. And now, like, hey, the guy that hits 220 isn't going to hurt me. I can take Dalton Varsha, who I love, right, but may hurt my batting average. So, like, I think Nico Horner is – uh, I think he's been underrated all draft season, and now that he's dropping, I think he's even more underrated. Yeah, I, I think with the drop, I'm definitely more in. Uh, again, he's on my board this year. I'm giving him the care and in consideration he needs, Nico Horner. And you talk about building that batting average foundation, and that is so, so, so crucial. You can't, but barring luck, flat-out luck, you cannot – improve your batting average in season it is so freaking hard to improve batting average via the waiver wire for those of you who weren't listening in october 
when we were talking about like the gladiator formats and you know what i was kind of doing with some of my gladiators one of the things i looked at in terms of like the overall standings on nfbc and i think this does relate to just your traditional league is how few points of batting average separated people in the standings mm -hmm. right Goody batting average can vault you to the top of the standings in a way that like getting a really good power hitter can't, even though you, he affects more than one category in terms of run or RBIs and home runs um, because those standings are so bunched together. So like getting guys who can deliver good batting averages, you know, and even the guys that like don't deliver good batting averages, but have a lot of variance to them. Like, I know Kyle Schwarber is a guy who's going to hurt your batting average. And so people are, some people are just going to kind of take him off the board, but if he's also a guy who can have variance in the batting average. So if you plug in the 210, like, and he hits 240, all of a sudden, like that is a massive gain for your overall team standings, especially if you kind of pair him with an eco Horner. So um, I think batting average is one of those things that people need to make sure at the top of their draft they're getting. Yeah, I, I totally agree there. And uh, Nico Horner could definitely be that guy for you. All right, moving on here. We're going to, uh, well, one more in the top 100. Nolan Jones down 12 picks. This one's not terribly surprising. This is a guy I've talked about. You know, he's in my bust list. 401 Babip, that's the easiest thing to look at. But he does have power and speed. And not, like I've talked about how this is one where I have to divorce my heart from my head. I like him as a player. I root for Nolan Jones. I think he's an intriguing guy, but the market's ready to pay full freight probably thinking that he can be a batting average asset with his power and speed. And I think he's somebody who could easily hit 230. Like it wouldn't even be some crazy down season for him. The craziest part about Nolan Jones this season isn't what he did in Coors. It's what he did on the road. And there's just no way I'm going to believe that that's going to happen again. For context, Nolan Jones last year blasted a 434 BABIP on the road. 374 at home he can repeat the home one but i think it could go down 100 points if not more on the road 150 yeah. points and it wouldn't even be like oh my god what a huge failure it'd be more like there's the normal course hangover effect paired with somebody who strikes out way too much i am very nervous he is going down still not down enough for me nolan jones down to pick 65 in the main event i need I don't know, another 20 picks to be even start to look at him. And even his his max at 78 isn't getting me there. Where have you been on Nolan Jones and where do you think about or what do you think about the, the dip here? I mean, he's been the, the guy I've been, you know, screaming about being a huge bust all draft yeah. season. So like yeah. nothing and by the way, changed. we're not alone. Like this is like yeah. kind of an industry thing. Although at the same time, his price is still high. So some people are still thinking. Yeah, him. there are there are plenty of people in the industry who are who who love Nolan Jones. Um, I, he's striking out at a 38% clip right now Yeah, in spring. I mean, and what's the really interesting part. And I think some people are going, you know, cause often what we do, what we've been doing this spring is going, Oh, this guy's striking out at this clip, but look at his swing and strike rate. It's that, the, that doesn't match up. Mm -hmm. So you look at the, you know, 38% strikeout rate and then you, you know, scroll down to the swing strike rate and you go, well, it's only 13%. Maybe you should be string, uh, striking out at a 20, you know, seven, 28% clip. Um, no, the reason why he is striking out at such a high clip with the swing strike rate not being that high is because he's not good at making contact in the zone. He is, he is like not good at it. Like he's just so bad at it. And like I, I think this has the potential for like he has a potential for like a two ten batting average. Um, I agree. Even and I in think, Colorado, I think Nolan Jones could do that. Yeah. Totally, 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 totally agree. And that's what scares me about yeah. him. Yeah, I just can't take him inside of the top hundred. It just it's not going to happen. Nope, uh, that's exactly where I'm at with Nolan Jones. And again, I will actually be rooting for him. So if I'm wrong on this one, and people I'm not draft screw him, Nolan Jones. No, no, I, I I like him. I hope he does well. Uh, and if you want to jam it in my face, if you draft him, he does well. That's fine. But process over results. I can't do it. Nothing yeah. lines up here to suggest that he can come close to repeating this season. So you're looking at maybe like a 220, 230 batting average. Even if you say 240, I still don't want to pay the premium for that uh, because not only it, now if you take Nico Horner with him, that's only canceling him out. So now Nico Horner's average isn't really a benefit for you. It's only a cancellation. So uh, yeah, that's just where I'm at right now. Now with Nolan Jones can't do it. Now we move picks 101 to 200. We'll go a little bit quicker on these here. Where, where are you at on time, by the way? Um, 
I got another 30 minutes or so. Okay, then we can get through these and, and still yeah. take some take some time. Uh picks 101 to 200. Biggest jump is Roberto Suarez. Or Robert Suarez, excuse me. 67 picks. Um probably going to jump more because he got the save. I know that sounds dumb, but that we are a reactive bunch us fantasy folks. And now that people see him as the guy, it was a great outing. I wouldn't be surprised if Suarez goes up even more. Where do we stand on Robert Suarez here? Uh pick 156 right now. Let's let's bump him just as a guess. Let's bump him to like 135. Would you pay that? Yeah, he's 145 over the last six there you, games. There you go. Um, so he'll probably be it, about it, 135 it, yeah. tomorrow. 136 is the min. So, um, man, this sucks. Like, you know, and I know you already alluded to it earlier on in the show, but, like, you and I are both in on Robert Suarez as a, just a really sneaky, um, good late pick as, like, your, your third closer. <laughs> now, all of a sudden, it's like, yeah, he's – a uh, closer two, and maybe for some people a closer one. Yeah, um, yeah, it is what it is. I guess uh, I, I might still do it. I might. I'm just. Do it. I'm just. Especially bawling. with all with all the other injuries. I'm glad exactly. I got early shares, but uh, yeah, I mean, I I wish I uh, I wish I'd done a main. You know, the 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 unfortunate part for me in terms of like, you know, like. Uh, I'm not doing two mains this year, but if I was going to do two mains, I would have done one before the games in Korea and now one after. Uh, and um, but yeah, it's what That's it a is. Good call. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think he's the dude in San Diego. Like, I don't think that there is going to be much question to that. Like, obviously, if he struggles, they could like move to Matsui, but I think that he needs to struggle. He needs to fail. Um, in order for that to happen. I think Robert Suarez is kind of a lockdown dude right now. Yep. I, I, he's the dude until proven otherwise. And uh, I don't have major concerns about that for Robert Suarez. So I will pick him. Good call there about maybe next year we do the um, – we do one before the Japanese series or before the series yeah. in Japan and then one after just in case if you love guys that are on those teams just because you know if they show out their prices will go up it just happens and it doesn't always take a rogue drafter if you listen to Jeff Erickson's podcast you know about the rogue drafter who literally drafted a bunch of Seattle and Oakland guys one year for their Japan series and then didn't guess, have enough names on his sheet and they had to stop the yeah, draft for a minute yeah. I guess just to show himself in first for a week very bizarre like what I, was your I don't end game there i don't th i don't think he'd ever played fantasy before i think he just uh, clearly. Like, said like this is gonna be because he like would my understanding and i wasn't there this year so um but my understanding is he actually showed up with like a magazine and a literal magazine to draft oh off of and when they got into like the like mid 20s like he didn't have any names left on his sheet because he was drafting off of a magazine that was printed in october <laughs> um and so like he went with the names he knew and the names he knew were guys he had just watched play in japan on the a's and uh in seattle so like i don't think it was like intentional i'm gonna be in first place at the end of this weekend i mm -hmm. think it was more of a matter of like i don't know what i'm doing uh, that seemed to be a little evident yeah. there yeah, um, but anyway E even outside of that, it doesn't take that for the guys that play in these early couple games to rise in ADP, even if it's just kind of putting them on the radar of some folks. Oh, I didn't think about Robert Suarez being the dude, or I wasn't confident that he was the dude. Now he is. Even Evan Phillips might have suffered the same fate. Oh, I didn't know he was the dude. Now I'm going to go ahead and take him confidently. And there you go. You see an ADP rise. So Robert Suarez is the biggest jump, picks 101 to 200. Our next biggest jump up, a little, a little bit of contention, a guy we've had some debates over, Cabrian Hayes jumping up 63 picks. I can't imagine that you're super keen on this, given some of the debates that we've had with him. His new ADP here in the main event is pick 117. Even for me, that's a little bit of a bummer. One of the things I've always loved about Cabrian Hayes is that his price yeah. is a bit lower. Like That's one of the things I've been in on because okay, I can get him at a fair price. 63 pick jump is pretty substantial. What the hell's driving this in your estimation? The huge spring and everybody oh, talking yeah. about him. Um, yeah, like spring training. I loved his price before. Like, I, you know, as much as I have tried to like pump the brakes a little bit on your love for him. I didn't realize uh, he was hitting 405 with a 5% yeah. K rate. <laughs> yeah, like he's just, he's murdering the ball in spring. 
um you know every day i see like a brian hayes uh uh highlight so uh and you know i think this is one of those guys that a lot of people who play fantasy have, have always like loved and wanted including yeah. both of us and have always wanted him to like have the breakout i caution people like this is this is too high like this I'm sorry, is full price. This is this is above full price. Like he's going right behind Nolan Arenado, a Hall of Famer who you can pencil in a stat line for. I'm taking Nolan Arenado a hundred times out of a hundred over Cabrian Hayes. Uh, if he had yeah. jumped up to like the 150, the 140 area, I'd still be fine with it. But 115, like, is just too this, much. Like, this is a lot, and I've been the you know. Bang We're talking about a max pick over the last six drafts is 131. Like, I just can't do that. Meaning that's the latest he goes. That yeah. is, yeah. I, I, and again, I, we can't, we don't have to blame ourselves. It wasn't our big mouths. It, it's the huge spring, 405 average, three bombs. I think it's the three bombs yeah. more so. It than is the, the three too. bombs. Yeah. Because, yeah, people are looking for the power breakout. He doubled his home run total last year. Cabrian Hayes from seven to 15. People are thinking, can I get 25 now? But probably not that many, but even like 20 to 22 double digit steals and a huge batting average. For me, the best area for real gains for Cabrian Hayes is batting average. Even if uh, he hit another 15. I don't think that is the best. 295. Place well, what do you think is? Cause you haven't been in on his p power at all. It's plate appearances. It's staying on the F and field Cabrian Hayes. Well, that, like, that would be huge. Volume would be. Yeah. Because it's been 136 and 124 games the last two years. If he hit 600 plate appearances, with a big batting average yeah. because then now it's going to be even more impactful while it jumps up so i understand the excitement but man it's just more egregious than i thought i just didn't think it would get that much excitement yeah. for combined. i'm glad i got a couple early shares because i don't think i'm gonna get him this weekend i just don't think it's gonna happen i don't either because at this price point he needs to perform a bit right like there, yeah. there's not as much wiggle room as there was when he was four rounds cheaper so uh -huh. i love cabrizi i have shares as well because i've been taking him in the winter but i can't do it this one surprised me i even put a little exclamation mark next to him the hell's mason miller moving up 60 picks for and in people fairness, think he's going to be the closer in oakland i know i haven't been in on him at all this this season just because i don't know what we're going to get i know he's like penciled in to, uh, for the contention of the closers job they haven't said 100 percent, have they no and i think they're going to use him in a multi-inning relief role which means he could come in sometimes in the sixth. He could sometimes exactly. come in in the fourth. He could sometimes come in in the eighth. Like He's also having uh, a blazing spring, 41% yeah. K rate, 5% walk rate in his six innings of work. Skills are great, but like, like, let's say he is like, I don't think he would be like the quote unquote guy, but like, let's say he does share the closer role with like Danny Jimenez, right? Okay. If you're splitting the saves in Oakland, how much do we care? <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, saves are saves, but like, but are they you, like because well, yeah. they're well, okay. If we're if we're how many the rosy picture, how many seventeen sa saves? Seventeen. I don't think he's getting seventeen saves as he's sharing the job. Do you think, I think he's getting 50, twelve? Fifty? Are you talking fifty fifty? Yeah, share? yeah, yeah, like a fifty. 50 okay, share. okay, yeah. Then that would be closer to it's to like 12, twelve. 13. Yeah, what do yeah, I yeah. care about twelve saves from? Well, if you're getting amazing ratios and a bunch of K's with it, but he can't be your RP two. At this well, no, price, I, no, 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 yeah, no, no, no. I, I the agree problem, with the, the problem the price is the point. price. The price he's up like, four rounds to pick 171 yeah. Mason Miller. What the hell? I mean, I, I guess can't it's do not it. like an egregious price where you're going, like, oh, you know, like, especially if he's your third closer. Um, Alex but, Lang goes goes right there. Give me Alex he's the, Lang. He's all the day guy long. in Detroit. Okay. Yeah, yeah give yeah, me I'm, Alex I'm with you. all day long. Um, let me see what other closer I can find that's going around there. Jose LeClerc's going a little bit yep. more expensively at 159. I'll take him all day. Well, and LeClerc's rising too. Um, yeah, so. LeClerc, LeClerc is on the rise. He's up 37 picks. Um, and could yeah, he's go at, even he's higher at one, tomorrow. He's at 148 right now over the last So drafts. that's another 11 pick jump from the Because they, they announced him here. as the closer they did. over the last couple yep. of days. So, um, yeah, um, I just can't draft Mason Miller at that price. I can't like, either. I, 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 there's another one. I'll be rooting for him because he's a yeah. fun pitcher to watch. I hope he stays healthy, but miss me with that price point. I can't yeah. do it. Henry Davis is up 57 picks. I know exactly what this is. It's a huge spring paired with the fact that he's going to get closer eligibility in season. Catcher Former, eligibility. Or what did I say? Closer. <laughs> if he becomes a closer, that will not be. Yeah, that, he won't that, have any saves. 
I mean, if he's a closer, he could. I mean, I guess if he, if he becomes the closer, sure, then yeah. you get a two-way uh, Henry Davis. No, catcher yeah. eligibility. He's up about four rounds, 57 picks. I could see him rising even more tomorrow as well. What are we doing with Henry Davis at pick 182 with a min of 153? If we if we say he's more in the 150 to 160 range, let's operate off of that. What are you doing with Henry Davis tomorrow? Not Doesn't have C yet. Going to get catcher eligibility two weeks into the season. I think it's gone. I think the love has gone too far. Oh, um, you're probably right. I like I like Henry Davis, but you're probably I, right. I, I do too, but I think part of the thinking is like, hey, in his off days, he can play the outfield or he can DH. I don't know that we're guaranteed that. Like, and now he's going above Jonah Hine. He's right behind Kai Barry Ruiz. Like, I think both those guys should be going. Like, even if you like automatically gave Henry Davis catcher eligibility, he should not be going above Jonah Hine. Who is the number one catcher in baseball uh, until he got hurt uh, last year? Um, so, yeah. like, I just think the price point has gotten too high. Um, if he fell in a draft, like if he fell like around his uh, max over the last six days, which is one ninety four, um, I could understand it because then he's after Jonah Heim, and the next catcher is Luis Camposano. So, I I can understand that, and I I might be down for that. But ultimately, uh, I don't think he's going to fall anymore. I think he's going to continue to rise little by little. Um, and uh, I think that means I'm not getting any Henry Davis this weekend. Yeah, I mean, it's pricey. It's yeah. pricey. Um, I'm not fully out. But you, you mentioned Jonah Heim. You know I love Jonah Heim. I, so I took I'm Henry good. Davis in our head to head league. I know right? you did, you garbage bag. Yeah. So, oh, by uh, the way, my biggest regret in that draft and like I know the that catcher depth, we talked about it, but it's taking a catcher before the last round. <laughs> yes, because yeah. uh, Matt Matt R. I don't I don't need to dox him with his full name. Yeah, uh, but in our draft, Rum Diesel. Rum by. Diesel. Yeah, and I always call yeah. him Rum Diesel. He took Jonah Heim with the last pick, which is an amazing pick. Yeah, took he, Adley Rutschman in the fourth. He sniped. He sniped me. Um, because I, I, I love Adley, obviously, but one catcher league. And that, that was my last one catcher league of the year, but a big regret. Just wait. Yeah. Just wait. Yeah. It I was that I, deep. I took Henry Davis. I can't remember what round it was, but then in the last round, I took Logan Hoppy. I was like, I knew like there's only going to be 14 dra cat, uh, catchers drafted yeah. in this league. And I was totally fine ending up with a 14th catcher off my board. Yep. Um, and yep, yep, like, yep. look, Logan O'Hoppy is a fine catcher. In I, one I doofed it. League. Like, yeah, I doofed just, it. Like you should Adley's, just never draft a catcher before the last few rounds. Of, Adley's of advantage. I mean, and it doesn't have to be the last few rounds, but like just not round four, just not yeah. round four, especially with the way pitching was going. I just, I doofed it there. Yeah. I, I should not have taken him there. And I I'm filled with regret. I should have taken Bobby Miller. Like I wanted to, because I was going to try to get Bobby Miller on the way back and guess who freaking took him rum Deasy. So yeah. I got smoked there and that was frustrating. And uh, then to very see fun him... draft. Very, very, fun Oh yeah. Draft. Hell of a draft. Yeah, and and just... it. yeah, we got three more picks left. Um, and then you get to input those rosters. There's a pick that got deleted. Did you see that? Uh, 12th, uh, 12th team. Oh no. Their fourth round pick. I'm sure we can figure by process of elimination who it is, and and Ross probably knows who he picked. And I'm, you know, he can't lie because then we can go see if somebody else has that guy and say, no, you didn't take, you know, Bobby Witt Jr. in the fourth round, you liar. But uh, I'm sure he'll be honest about who it is. So somebody might have accidentally deleted it. It's uh, pretty easy for me to figure out who it was because I can just look at the old version. Oh yeah, yeah, there's it. historical versions. So and, very easy. Uh, uh, and I can figure it out by, you said it was Ross's fourth pick? Yes. Uh, pick 12. Uh, slot 12, <laughs> I should say. While, Adolis while Garcia! That, oh, then maybe I deleted it. Yeah, you I probably was, did. I was trying to help him. Uh, yeah. Four four of the biggest drops are major injury guys in the 100 to 200 range, 101 to 200 range. Cole, McLean, Josh Lowe, Justin Verlander. Two of them we talked about already. Cole and Verlander we've already discussed previously. Uh, McLean and Lowe this episode. So let's move on and talk Jordan Walker, a guy we actually talked about indirectly early on. Um, down 38 picks. The hate continues to go too far. I don't get it. I will take the discount though. I, I'm I'm fine. I really I don't think he was bad last year. No, he didn't pan out to the highest end level that people were expecting, ourselves included. But now he's down to pick 135. 
okay, he's back outside the top 100. I didn't really love him in the top 100, even though I wasn't out on that either. But now that Jordan Walker's not in the top 100, where do you stand on him? Pick 135 right now in the main. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is finally a price point where I might end up with some Jordan Walker. I think he was going a little bit too high. Um, in some you of the were promoting tests. so heavily last year, and then you I was. push came to shove. Yeah. Um, we, uh, but like, it's really interesting. Cause like the guy, if you look at like where he's going in the last six drafts, he's going 138. Um, the guy going 135 is a guy we were getting at 180 a few weeks ago, uh, in Jaron Duran um oh wow I'm so, Duran love. yeah duran has uh been moving up quite a bit here uh as well uh rightfully so i love jaron duran this year i don't know if i love him at 135 but um that's full price uh i think i will end up with a share of jordan or i could end up with a share of jordan Rock. yeah i don't know that I you can never guarantee um, anything but yeah over the course uh, of five drafts you're gonna have five cracks at it some of those are auctions too so you can yep. maybe even get them cheaper than what a 135 pick would translate to dollar wise but yeah, I mean, what are we seeing in the sophomore campaign here? You're seeing a, a solid step forward. Obviously, it's hard to predict a major jump. Uh, it's in the cards, no pun intended, I guess, since he's on the Cardinals. But, um, you know, what do we think here? I think the biggest thing that he could gain is what you were saying with Cabrian Hayes. Volume could just be the way yeah. that he breaks out and just plays for 620 plate appearances because he had four, 465 last year with he, and he went 16, 7, 276. That's not too bad at all from Jordan Walker. And that's why I stay bought in on him. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think he, I mean, I think he does like get more volume, especially with all the injuries in the outfield right now in, mm -hmm. uh, in St. Louis, St. Louis is missing Tommy Edmond. They're missing a uh, large new bar. Um, Dylan Carlson sucks at baseball. Shut um, up, you stupid so, jerk. <laughs> it's true, though. Uh, it's not true. So I think Leave Walker at least can volume his way to a better stat line than last year. I do. Say, I will say, like, the strikeouts have been a little bit concerning in spring training. He's got a 28% strikeout rate, which <laughs> is kind of in line with where some of the projection systems had him coming into last year. Yeah. Um, so uh, that is something to monitor a little bit, but I think there's plenty of power. I think there's some speed in this profile. He's already got two stolen bases in spring. Um, and, and two cots, which actually isn't yeah. a bad thing. Speed, uh, SB volume, your attempts yep. matter as, as an indicator of how much you might run in a coming year. Yep. So I, I do like to see that, even though he's been caught a couple of times. So I, I am definitely very, very intrigued. Uh, I don't know if I've drafted Jordan Walker this year. Uh, but I'm gonna double check right now. I do. I have I not. Have um, so I wouldn't mind getting a share this weekend. And I think this is another one of these examples of a guy who was a top tier prospect. Um, you know, didn't I, I don't want to say he struggled, but didn't produce in the way that people expected to him. And he now, didn't pop off. Yeah, he yeah. was fine last year. And now people I, were expecting him to be a god. And. Now the price point is affordable. I don't want to say it's cheap. You're still paying a top 150 pick, which is in top Agreed. 10 rounds of a of a 15 team league, just outside uh, of a top 10 round in a 12 team league. But I think this is a really interesting gamble, um, especially if he drops in drafts. So uh, I like Jordan Walker. Yeah. Um, again, and I, I've been there the whole time. I remain there. Obviously, if you're going to bring the price down for me, I'm even more interested yep. in labor. When I took 52 Cardinals in a row. Um, Jordan Walker was one of them. So I mean, two of the other ones have been hurt though. Edmund, actually three of them, Edmund, Newt Barr, and um Sonny Gray. So I jinxed your team, y'all. Sorry. My, my 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 bad Cardinals fans. I I I I hexed your team. Oh well, shouldn't shouldn't have beat my favorite team in the World Series when you were the much worse team. I'm still bitter about that cry about it anyway moving on what do we got here we got a couple more you, got, you, you suffered a lot of those losses i just think Shut about my giants up, um, dude i knew you're gonna be i shouldn't even brought it up i opened the yeah you, you brought know, it up like i don't know why you're getting mad at me like yeah like just... i am still mad at you Jorge Soler down two rounds 31 picks um is this just kind of like boring old power hitter that you know the the nfbc studs that we talk about are going to end up taking and get 30 bombs from yep or are we okay so talk to us about Jorge Soler on your team now, on your favorite Every team. Every year, Anthony Santander gets overlooked in main event leagues. He's because... also down, by the way. Yeah, Anthony. of course he, he is. He just missed the cut on this <laughs> list. He's down 20 picks. So that's funny yeah. that you bring up Santander. But talk uh, to us about Soler. But 
Yeah, Jorge Soler fits that exact same profile as a guy who, like, people are like, oh, well, he doesn't run at all, and, like, the batting average isn't necessarily going to be great, so you're really only getting two categories. Uh, yeah, the two categories that are kind of hardest to get in fantasy right now, which is uh, RBIs and home runs. So, um, hell of power. Solid and me- run total, too. 77 runs isn't bad yeah. for this pick. Um, and, like, Maybe the fact that he's going to San Francisco, which is, you know, a historically bad park to hit in, um, is scaring people a little but bit. Mostly for um, lefties. Mostly for lefties and not for Hori Soler. Like, Hori Soler no. hit, like, 48 home runs in Kansas City. He like, broke out in KC. Like, Thank yeah, you. Like, he just, he's not going to be – and he, he just hit 36 in Miami. Yeah. like I don't if, care what park he plays in. Yeah, like, he's never played in a good park. Like we He don't could even... go to Baltimore and, and yeah. pop a bunch of homers, for God's sakes, with if that Jorge new If Soler is sitting there at pick 190, like, he's going to be on my team. Like, it's just... Yeah, same. Like, And this that... is, again, one of the reasons I love an auction, because, like, I just scrolled down to where Jorge Soler is going. One of the reasons I love an auction is because, like, in a snake draft, it might be really hard for me to get... All of these guys between pick 178 um, and one, you know, 197 that I love. This is an area that includes Cedric Mullins, Willie Adamas, Jonah Heim, Brandon Fat, Vinny Pascantino, Christopher Sanchez, like Brian Bayo, Carter Crawford, Josh Long, Nestor Cortez, Jorge Soler. But I could put all of those guys Is on that an your auction. roster. Yeah, I could, I could put every single one of those guys on an auction team. Uh, and feel really damn good about that team. So, uh, yeah, Hoyer Solari is, I think, just a, a dynamite value. Yeah, I, I love it. This is one of those old, boring guys that we talk about that gets overlooked. And in the later rounds, you just take him, and you're like, no one goes an Asia on that one. But you just lock in uh, 30 plus homers if he stays healthy and he has some injury risk, but that's covered in the price. I say that all the time with guys like this. Yes, he could hit 13 like he did in 2022 with a 207 average. He got cut at a certain point. You moved on, and you can move on at this price point. I love Jorge Soler here. Uh, Spencer Torkelson is having a dreadful spring, and I got to imagine that's a big reason behind this dip for him. 27 picks, um, no homers, and 18 WRC+. plus. I don't know. I'm not that worried about it, but he has moved down to pick 137. What are you doing with Spencer Torkelson? Yeah, I mean – uh, I'm not super worried about it. Spencer Torkelson. I think he's going to be fine, ultimately. I mean, I guess the 34% strikeout rate is a bit concerning. Um, swing strike rate's only up one point, though. He's not up there hacking. Yeah. And, and his he's, walk he's, rate's he's up he's a point. He's 11% swing strike rate. So, like, I'm just not that worried um, about it. So, uh, I also think that, again, like we talked about with Goldschmidt, um, yes. is, Definitely like, be. first base is deep. And so some people are probably going like, hey, why take Torkelson here when I can get, you know, Josh Bell or Anthony Rizzo later uh, yeah. or Jose Abreu later. Fair. So and I totally think that's fair because I think, you know, like there have been drafts where I go, I am just going to pass on first base and I'm going to take my, you know, guy later. Uh, so that being said, I love Torkelson. I think he was a value already. Now he's dropping. I still think it's a great value. Yep. Every uh, let's see here. We have. 18 first basemen that have been going in the top 200 and all but one, two, two, all but two are down or equal in this yeah. ADP change here. So to your point, the position is being moved down. People are moving up the less deep positions and pitching and saying, I can get first base makes total sense to me. By the way, our boy, Anthony Rizzo is up 67 picks. People finally catching on, but still at pick 227. I'm okay Fine. with that. I'm okay, I'm totally with, it okay too. with that. Yeah. He should have been going there the whole time, to be yeah, honest. So, absolutely. Um, uh, last one, another first baseman, but I do want to get your thoughts on him because I don't think we've talked much about Vinny P this uh, this spring. And you were mentioning him in that big glob of players that you like. Um, I know we've been Vinny P guys on this channel before. Didn't have the season that we wanted last year because he got hurt 61 games and out. So, we didn't really get a chance to see what was up with him. Only hit 247. I don't believe that's who he is, though. He had a 250 Babbitt. I think if he had played the full season his with his plate skills and his line drive capabilities, I think his average would have gotten back up. He hit 295 back in 2022 when he broke out in that sort of half season. Um, I'm still very intrigued by Vinny Pasquantino, but he's down 25 picks with all these other first basemen moving down. What do you think of a 193 ADP Vinny P? Uh, 
I would like to introduce you to my most drafted first baseman this year, and that is Vinny <laughs> Pasquantino. Uh, I love Vinny P. I am much higher on him than the industry prior to this dip. So mm -hmm. you know he's going to end up on at least one of my you know final drafts. Uh, love the bat to ball skills. You know, we were talking about it with Nico Horner. I love these guys who make a lot of contact because they give themselves the opportunity to be lucky. I also think there's 30 home runs in this bat. Um, uh, like, so I'm, I'm a big fan of Vinny P. If we're drafting him in the top 100 next year, I'm not going to be surprised. Uh, Ooh, like I, th I, like I think it. like we had the Christian Walker breakout, uh, last year, a couple of years ago. Um, and I think this is a Vinny P breakout year. So, um, if we haven't talked about him enough, I apologize, but I love Vinny P. Yeah, I, I don't have anything to add there. I'm not just going to say the same stuff. I'm a big fan. I'm intrigued. I don't think the price point is too high, especially even, even before the dip. But now with the dip, Vinny P makes sense to buy here. And you want to talk about maybe getting some later draft batting average. This is another guy that can help your batting average. Um, and so even if the power doesn't come all the way to fruition the way Justin thinks and he hits more of like 2022, if it comes with a 285 average, I'm okay with that. And if the Royals do take a step forward, which Justin and I have been talking about all winter and spring, saying that their their lineup could be sneaky solid, then his runs and ribbies are going to be there too. He's yeah. a reason why he's he's one of the chief reasons why we believe that their lineup can be better. Um, Finney Pasquantino. So yeah, definitely agree with that one. And that's gonna wrap it up. Bunch of hitter moves uh in the 100 to 200 range there, a bunch of pitcher moves up in the top 100, exactly like we thought it would be with the main event. Justin, we got main events tomorrow. Uh, you have an auction tonight. Then what, what's on Sunday then for the five days in a row? So I have, yeah, I have the auction on uh, the $150 NFBC auction uh, Friday. I have main event Saturday. Sunday, I think afternoon or evening, I have the $1,500 uh, uh, auction. Monday, I have the Beat Justin Mason League, which still has mm -hmm. spots available, at least as of now. Um, and then on Wednesday, I have another $1,500 auction. So excellent. I've been twing back and forth on whether or not I should change that last draft to another main event or if I should keep it an auction. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I will definitely have a draft Wednesday night. Um, so if it's the auction, it'll be at 5 p.m. Eastern. If it is the main event draft, it'll be at 7 p.m. Eastern. So, but I'll be live streaming all of those drafts. You can find the links on fan graphs for not only the actual video of the live stream, but the live draft boards as well. Excellent. All right. So I'll be live streaming tomorrow at uh, around two, or excuse me, about one central, I think is when I'll go live for the draft that starts at 1.30. Let me make sure I got those times right here. Do, do, do. Oh, no, excuse me. It starts at 1, so I'll be I'll be live about 30 minutes before, kind of get everything situated, set up the board and all that, and uh, talk through some things. Obviously, I know people in my draft could be in there, so I'm not going to be saying who I'm taking three, four rounds down the line, but the streams have gone pretty well in the past yeah. where you know we can still kind of talk about what we're looking to do, uh, a couple picks before things are going. I could even set a delay, which I did the very first year I did it, kind of like a poker stream, because if you ever watch a poker stream, obviously they don't want to have their, they, they need to have a delay or else they could get completely snaked by people coming in and smoking mm -hmm. them. So if if I wanted to be like more open about talking things, I could set a delay. The last couple of years I haven't. And I just end up, you know, like I said, only talking about picks when I'm like two, three picks away. So we'll see. Either way, I will be live twitch.tv slash spore. You can find me there. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. We've had a lot of great times in the past years. Justin, good luck in your draft. I'm sure we will be ch chatting in between. I'll be in your stream and um, We'll review some boards on Monday. I'm very excited, yeah. man. Have a great weekend. And oh, are you potting on Sunday with Justin or Jason? Because I know he's traveling right I, now. He's in New York. I have to double check, but I am going to be on the Rotowire podcast uh, with Bye. Eric Halterman um, on Sunday as well. So excellent. Uh, if I you, love uh, you all. if I'm hoping, I will text Jason after this and see if he's going to be available on Sunday. Uh, okay. And if he is, we will record. Uh, if not, then maybe I will try to pull somebody who's not in Vegas to do an episode uh so that way we get another one up okay sounds fantastic and you know maybe i'll be available on sunday oh it'll be after it'll be after the mains both of ours maybe we do a main rundown then and then maybe monday's just a standard you know yeah, news i would love that so, um, so ping me, me if Justin, jason's not available i've been waking up 
you know, I, I got a normal adult schedule now. I can do it in the morning. Yeah, so. I record it like 10 year time. So it's yeah. not like. So, uh, so hit me up. Uh, maybe I'll be the fill in there and we'll, we'll do it that way. Uh, but anyway, good luck. Go get your guys. Have a great one. I'll talk to you later. Peace. Take it easy.